I, I want, before I begin, I want, I want to say how appreciative I am um, for Charlene for your reading and the, and the, um, the school teacher coming through that, that you read in a way that really brought the, the story alive. And, um, and also for your, for your, forgive me for this, but for, for your accent and, and staying naked. Um, I was always taught that that naked means that you don't have any clothes on, but naked means that you don't have any clothes on and you're up to something. <laughs> and, um, and, and how appropriate that is for Adam and Eve um, in their hiding, they must have been up to something. They certainly were overcome with guilt and shame and blame. Um, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for um, this congregation. Thank you for our, our place and our chance to worship you, to talk about your stories, to talk about what your um, will is for us, and uh, may your Holy Spirit come and bless us as we um, discuss and, and, and think about this um, so powerful of stories. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I decided in this... Um, as we read through the Bible in a year, um, I wanted to preach in reflection of that too, as I've done with other all church things that we've done. Um, but I think all of us ran into the same realization that in the first three days there had already been eight important stories that that um, needed addressing, and. Um, Looking ahead, there will be some time that we will spend in Leviticus and Numbers and some other things that are a little bit more, less colorful, less stories, and so we'll probably catch up at some point, but I wanted to take the time and to read through and preach on some of these important characters and, and events that take place in Genesis. Um, so week to week, they'll be reflecting of where we have already been in the, in the reading of the um, scripture. Um, there's so much in these stories. There's so much wisdom um, that we can hear, that we can learn from, and that can give our faith some depth. Because that's what the Old Testament really does, right? Um, it gives our faith depth. The New Testament... You know, it talks about Jesus, it talks about what we've come to believe, what we know about God and all of that, but the prologue of the Old Testament really gives that its meaning and its depth, our, our understanding of it. It makes us understand better who we are, who God is, and why we are so desperately in need of Jesus um, to save us. Last week we talked about God in creation, his solo single, solitary, only he can do it, speaking of things into creation. That ancient Hebrew verb bara, which only God can do. But we also looked at what the Israelites saw metaphorically when they thought about God creating. How they did not really have a concept for nothing, of which for God to, to bring all of existence into. And how... Um, how can you see or think about or describe something that isn't? Only what is. So the idea of describing nothingness didn't make a whole lot of sense to them. So they described things that God was bringing. Light out of darkness. Waters. Chaotic waters. Waters. The very same waves that Jesus would calm with his words and that God would separate at the Red Sea. Those waters, those fear-filled waters, those out-of-control waters, God took and separated those waters, sea from sky, raised the land, held back the waters so that the land could be dry and that there would be a space for us to live and a time in which for us to be. As he held back the waters and ended darkness, he also brings order to the chaos. Order things perfectly formed, like no one else could even imagine. God brings 
into order. The fact that science is, the fact that we can study the patterns of this world and make conclusions about them are all due to God's inventing and bringing all things into a studyable order. Out of the chaos. So we think about it, all from Genesis 1, we find God's creating activities, including three things. Bringing light from darkness, separating waters to make space and time, and bringing order from the chaos. The rest is just filling that space, populating it, decorating it, ordering it, until he brings forth human beings, making us in his image. The very mirror of God. What a piece of work. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. Yet what to us is this quintessence of dust? To quote Shakespeare, man delights not me. I once had um, my students write poems based on pictures. I used to do this all the time, and there was this one where there were these two hands that were on fire and they were holding a burning earth as if forming it, right? And I told them, look at that picture and write a story. And I did the same. And I said, what would it be like if God would just reached out and tried to form the earth out of fire, but he forgot his gloves, burned his hands, uttered out a curse, and out popped humankind? That we were clothed, that we were furless, that we weren't really fast, that we weren't like the rest of the animals, that we were just like this mistake that popped out, but yet we had something about us that he loved. Sometimes it feels that way, how broken we are. Um, in Genesis 2, we get a different picture of human beings being created. God gets his hands dirty. God forms one of us, the first of us, out of the earth. Adam, which is the Hebrew word for earth. Dirt, soil, clay. The Greeks called that stuff that we dig in and plant in humus. And from that we get the word human being. The Hebrews saw it the same way. Dirt and the connection with humankind. In name and in creation, across cultures, there is a connection between earth, dirt, not the planet, but dirt, and human beings. Thus the tradition is that we are returned to the earth at our death, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But somewhere between this intimate, creating, speaking, forming, molding, and even woman being taken from man's rib and us is an inheritance of brokenness. There is something wrong with us. We seem out of place. We seem to be at war with ourselves. There is a major difference between what we think we ought to do and what we end up doing. There is a brokenness in ourselves, in our neighbors. We fight, we fear, we hoard, we objectify each other, we desire what works to destroy us. And all of the order that God has filled the world with, we seem to want to destroy so that we can build it better the way we think it should be. Even though we know somewhere deep inside we know it will destroy us and everything around us that we say we love. Kind of like taking up corn and cotton fields and replacing them with solar panels. <laughs> Seems like such a good idea. Not really. Not to anybody that lives near them or sees them. Not to the land that will ever, forever be broken by them. What is this thing, this brokenness within us? Ancient pagan religions explained these issues in many different ways. One was that we were created by, not by the head of the gods, but by some lower level god, 
a lesser God, and then the, the high God is mad at us and jealous of us that we were even created in the first place. So he goes out of his way to punish us every way that seems fit. That's basically the story of Zeus. Zeus doesn't create us, he just has to deal with us. There was this time when everything was perfect. This is another idea. But then came seasons, right? There was perpetual spring, and all you had to do to find food was to go outside and pick it. It was just there. But then all of a sudden came seasons, and there was no longer a perpetual spring where everything grew in abundance. There became hot and cold. There was the burning heat in the summer and the frost that covered cold in the winter. And all of a sudden, work was needed. You had to plant. You had to reap. And not everyone wanted to do the planting and the reaping. That was too much like work. It was possible instead for those to just take from those who had done the planting and the reaping. So the skills weren't about planting and the reaping. The skills were about building up to take and destroy and to fight. War, conflict, hatred, and fear were all products of simple economics. I was taught that economics meant the distribution of limited resources. If the resources weren't limited, then we wouldn't fight over it. And so at the root of it all is this materialist understanding that there's not enough stuff to go around. And therefore, human beings fight with each other. Sometimes the gods were angry, sometimes they were jealous, and sometimes they were angry just because human beings were too loud. The story, one of the flood stories, has to do with the gods sitting around in their council and be like, we have to do something with those human beings that are so stinking loud. We need to smite them and punish them because of that. Annoying. Whatever it was, they had and created stories that explained our brokenness, our pain, and our maladjustment. But the Hebrews were told a different story. One that we heard today, once read in story form, and then other clearly worded in description. Charlene read them for us, Genesis 3 and Romans 1, 18-25. We're all pretty familiar with the basics of the Adam and Eve story, the fruit, the snake, the decision, the sharing, the hiding, the blaming. So keep all of those ideas in mind as I read again for us parts of how Paul describes sin in his letter to the Romans. Verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. In other words, doesn't that follow from the story? God makes it clear, tend the garden, name the animals, be each other's helper, take care of all this for me, but don't eat of that tree. It's not like he doesn't tell them. 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Adam, where are you? We, we used to walk in the cool of the day. Didn't I understand? Didn't you understand? Didn't I tell you what this was about? Didn't I show you that I could speak things into creation and they would just be? Didn't you understand that? What part of that didn't you understand? No, they knew. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. What did it take? What did it take for them to stop glorifying God? A lie, right? That's what the, the serpent says. Did God tell you not to eat of any of the trees? He told us not to eat nor even touch that tree lest we die. The serpent then says, you will not die. In Hebrew, it's the exact phrase of God repeated again for the third time, only this time there's a little Hebrew word that's really just two letters jammed at the beginning of it, lo. And lo means that everything that follows this 
is not true. In other words, God lied. God is a liar. And he goes on to say, not only does God lie to you, but he did so on purpose because God is afraid of you. He's afraid of you becoming like him. And that then you will not need him anymore. Speaking things into creation, separating the waters to make space, establishing order in the chaos, a lie destroys all three. Just like that. Although they, this is verse 22, although they claim to be wise, they became fools. Does Eve claim wisdom? When, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Took and ate. And by doing she, verse 23, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings, birds and animals and reptiles. Now obviously it's not exactly birds and animals and reptiles, but it is the exact same thing. Exchanging the truth for this lie, and then the only thing that can come from that is created things. When you tell a lie, the world changes. Because the truth all of a sudden is brought into question. Isn't that a parallel? Does it come direct from here that Paul is writing? With no God, if there is no God, or if there's a God who lies, then all of a sudden there's this vacuum and a need, and so we fill that vacuum with things other than God. In Paul's time, it was those gods were pagan religions and statues and idols, those reptiles and all of those things that he describes. But now, it's anything that we use instead of God. The next verse, Paul says, Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Do we see this around us? Do we see this in human history? When the lie is believed and the vacuum is created and it is filled with other things, doesn't that tend to lead human beings to sinful desires, sexual impurity, and degrading of our bodies? The question is why? And verse 25 says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Look at the way that the two story, the, the, the two parts of the Bible are paralyzed, parallel. The story of Adam and Eve and the fall and the way that Paul describes human beings falling into sin. Exchange the truth for a lie, begin to worship created things like idols of stone, yes, but also anything that we create in our world to take the place of God. What is the exact thing that happens in the Garden of Eden? The truth of God is exchanged for a lie. And what happens when that's the case? If you have a God who speaks things into existence, let there be light. And you think that God's a liar, what does that mean? What is light then? And what is truth then? And what is this then? And what is that then? And what is what all of these questions just flow from that one lie being considered even only for a moment? So that leads me to the question poem that I put in the bulletin. A series of questions with no answer. You look at there, these are the, when does the fall actually happen? The question of when. Is it when the lie is spoken by the serpent? Is it when she hears the lie? Is it when she considers the lie? Is it when she decides the lie is true? Is it when she looks at the fruit? Is it when she sees its desirability? Is it when she sees and makes up her mind that it would be good for her? Is it when she thinks having knowledge of good and evil would be good for her? Is it when she starts to take the bite? Is it when, her, when it touches her tongue? Is it when her teeth break the flesh? 
Is it when the first juicy piece is swallowed? Is it when she gives it to her husband, Adam? Is it when they feel guilt? Is it when they notice their nakedness? Is it when they hide? Is it when they get caught? Is it when they blame each other? Is it when they get punished? Is it when they pass it on to their children? Yes, and it keeps happening. The most important part about this story is that we live it every day. Not that it happened thousands of years ago, 6,000, 10 billion, whatever it would be. It's not that it happens then, it's that it happens now. And it's, I said this to Sunday school, it was 10.30 then, I'd been up for four hours. It already happened to me at least 10, 15 times in just the first four hours that I was awake today. That question creeps in your mind, does this matter? And then you make a decision on whether it matters or not, and then you act accordingly. And usually the answer to that, does it matter? Eh, it doesn't really matter. I'll just do what I want. That's the beginning, right? But how often do we talk about that in church? How often do we talk about that in children's Sunday school, right? That we talk about the idea of all of these things that you're not supposed to do. The rules, right? The fruit. But it's the heart that makes those decisions. And it's the heart that we never talk about changing. We talk about changing the behavior, but we leave the heart alone. Because why? Because the heart is harder to deal with. It's a lot easier to tell a kid to be quiet and to sit and to do the things and tell them not to run in church because God doesn't like that. It's a lot harder to convince their heart why they shouldn't do those things. And to lose the desirableness of those things. But yet, I think that that moment, that moment, when Eve, just for a second, considers that lie, to be the moment it all falls apart. The moment it all falls apart. Because of what the lie creates. And we've been living in that since. And it's not all her fault. Because we do it ourselves. I, as I said, I've already done it 15 times today. Probably 16 now that it's half an hour later. <laughs> it's amazing how that works, right? I mean, like, the bell rang twice for Sunday school to be over. Yet we kept talking because we say, well, it doesn't matter whether church starts at 11 o'clock or not. Maybe, but it creates this, like, parallel situation. And that's just little things. When you talk about big things, it's huge. And the idea that the root, what Paul describes as the root of our sin is exchanging the truth about God for a lie. It's an amazing thing. And everything falls from that. Have you ever had a headache? I think that's a pretty standard human thing. You ever had a headache? What's your first solution to the headache? Is it to ask yourself why you have a headache? Or is it to take some Advil? Advil doesn't fix the reason why you have a headache. It just gets rid of it. Dealing with behavior doesn't fix the reason for the behavior. It just means that you don't have to deal with it anymore. How interesting is it and how hard, how much harder it is to deal with the root of the problem, which is a lack of faith in the truth. How interesting is it then that the Protestant Reformation would be built on this idea of salvation by faith? As if faith in the truth of God, in the same way that bad faith about the lie of God creates a world of sin, an idea of believing in the faith of the truth of God might be the beginning of remedying some of that. And that only comes when Jesus Christ shows us that much more about what God's about. 
Just like God shows up in the garden and we hide, Jesus shows up in the manger. The question is, do we hide from him? Or do we see that he comes in peace, that he comes in a way of forgiveness, and that he comes loving us enough to forgive us? I was looking in the, as we were going through the Bible, I'm a week ahead, at least a week ahead. So I was reading the Joseph story afresh. There's a point in time where Joseph has already forgiven his brothers. They've already had the great rec reconciliation moment in like verse in chapter 47. But then in chapter 50, after Jacob has died, after they've been living pretty high in Egypt, after they've been doing all of that for all of these years, after they've been living again as a family, they come to Joseph again and say, we need you to forgive us. And Joseph's response is beautiful. Just says, Joseph wept. Later on in the New Testament, in a verse that every child has, rem has memorized because it's very short, two words. He come, Jesus comes to Bethany, he comes and he's surrounded by people, all of the family of Lazarus, and they're all sad and broken and upset, and they say, Jesus, if only you were here, my brother would not have died. If only you were here. And in response to that, Jesus wept. In the same way that Joseph's brothers put limitations upon the power of forgiveness and the reality of forgiveness because they didn't believe, the people surrounded by Lazarus put limitations on the power of God and the power of Jesus. If only you were here. You can see in Jesus' tears, I am here now. And death has no authority. It didn't matter. Lazarus, come out. calling us to believe in not the limited truth about God, but in the full truth about God. That all of our doubts that we have been heir to since the first doubt was introduced into the world, they fall away in the face of the truth about Jesus Christ. May we again be attached to that truth and be changed forever by that truth. May it be so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our human nature seeks to limit your power to limit what you are, to create a vacuum that we can then insert ourselves into it and make those decisions and to be free and to think that our way is the better way. But our way leads to division and brokenness and pain and hiding and blame. And you are further and further lost from our minds. Yet you always show up. And there is a place within our hearts the desire to be made whole again. We thank you for sending Jesus Christ to fill that hole and to do much, so much more than our limited imagination can even fathom. May we be made whole through his love. And may our faith in him be our salvation. We pray those around us living in the darkness of fear and worry, of grief and pain, of 
wondering what tomorrow will bring. Those who are suffering from sickness or chronic ailments, chronic pain, hopelessness at our face. May we remember that God in his steadfast love always shows up. And his presence can be felt and is real. Often just when we need it the most. In the next moment, let us pray for those specifically in our midst, in our families, in our congregation, in our, in our hearts, by name or in the silence of the next few minutes. Lord, you know our desires before they even come to our lips. We dedicate to you and to your will all of these prayers. And we do so in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, 